I've spent nine years working in the tech industry as a software developer at a variety of different companies from startups to nonprofits. Throughout these years, I've made some critical mistakes that really stalled my career and even negatively impacted my life. They're lessons that I've had to learn the hard way. And in this video, I wanna go over some of the things I wish I could tell myself when I was just starting out. So if you're a new grad or even someone with several years of experience, watch this and learn from my mistakes. Mistake number one, not networking the right way. As an introvert, it can be really tempting to just clock in get your work done and leave right away without talking to anyone because you don't really want to be friends with your coworkers. But I actually think that this is a huge mistake. And I think we all know by now that referrals are one of the best ways, if not the best way to get a job offer these days. While there's nothing wrong with going to meetups and networking events and sending cold DMs on LinkedIn, every job referral that I've personally received Received that's led to a job offer are from people that I've worked with extensively either in school or at a professional setting. With the rise of remote work, this becomes even more important now because remote work, as much as I appreciate it, it does strip away the daily face-to-face -face interactions you have with your colleagues. And it becomes a little bit more difficult to establish that connection with your colleagues, especially if everyone's behind a screen and they have their cameras turned off. If I think about the last job that I had in office, and this was back in 2019 before COVID, I still remember a lot of the names, the faces, and the stories of the people that I worked with, and I interacted with everybody from different departments. And now I'm thinking about the remote job that I have right now, and I only know the people that I work with directly on my team, and I know them at much more of a surface level rather than a deeper level with the people that I work worked with face to face. I don't know about you, but personally, I always found it a lot easier in person to make these connections and build these friendships because, you know, when you're in person, you tend to have these spontaneous interactions. When you go wait for your coffee, you have a chat. When lunchtime comes, you gather a bunch of people to go to lunch with you, whether it's from people from your own team or from other departments. But now with remote work, typically when I have lunch, it's by myself and I'm alone browsing Reddit. Those of you that I've worked both both remotely and in office know exactly what I'm talking about. Let's be honest, you only really message people if you need something from them. Even worse, in a company with over 200 people, I only got to know like a handful of people. So if I were able to go back in time and what I plan on doing going forward is to invest more time and energy into developing these relationships with my coworkers. Like I said earlier, I'm still pro working from home, but I think it's good to bring up some of these less obvious downsides. Second biggest regret I have is not just tech related, but it's a little bit more financial and it's letting my lifestyle inflate. I wanna talk about the biggest financial mistake I made in my 20s. I consider myself pretty financially literate. I know not to get into debt and to invest early and often. Despite that, every time I got a pay raise, I could just feel my lifestyle inflate a little bit more. I swear this really happened without me even noticing it, but I was really increasing the number of times I was going out to eat every week and how much I spent on luxuries like takeout and clothes. And soon enough, without even me realizing it, the things that used to be luxuries like Starbucks coffees or new workout clothes and fancier gym memberships became necessities that I didn't even appreciate. It really just became my new default baseline. And when your peers are also spending $30 on overpriced salads and coffee every day, you don't really stop to question and reflect on whether or not that decision aligns with your own goals. When you're young and healthy and you don't have dependents to take care of, it's so easy to just like live in the moment and not really plan for the future. But we should all know by now that there is no such thing as job security these days. And one of the best things that you can do to insulate yourself from the ups and downs of this volatile market is having a big safety net that you can fall back on when and if you get laid off. 
When I got laid off for the first time back in, I think, 2017 or 2018, I realized that none of those material things mattered at all because they were so useless to me. All these luxuries that I purchased became liabilities. But the one thing that I was extremely grateful for were the savings that I managed to accumulate that would tide me over this challenging time. Because of my savings, I wasn't actually stressed about having to pay for groceries and rent. I was really able to take my time job searching and not have to settle for the first offer out of sheer desperation. That being said, I know personally that I could have done a lot better. If I had been more aggressive with saving and not let my lifestyle inflate, I probably could have spent those few months in between jobs, taking classes and upskilling, or traveling rather than sitting at home bored and twiddling my thumbs. Getting laid off doesn't necessarily have to be this cataclysmic event that you see happening on LinkedIn every day. You know, people losing their houses, having to move out of the city, in fact, if you really are diligent with your finances, it could honestly be a sabbatical or a career break. It goes without saying that there are definitely people out there who don't have the privilege of being able to establish that financial safety net and getting laid off is going to be devastating no matter what due to circumstances outside of their control. I am not talking about those people. I'm talking about people like myself who had the room in the budget to, to establish that financial safety net, but blew it on luxury items and letting their lifestyle inflate. It's only after I lost my job due to a layoff that I realized that the best thing money can really buy for you is sense of security from worrying about money and the freedom to not have to tolerate toxic workplaces and managers out of desperation. My next mistake is not making a strong first impression. Several years ago, I switched over to a brand new team at my company and because I was the brand new person, I felt like I didn't really have a lot to contribute during the meeting, so I kind of just sat back and listened. Before my old manager left the company to pursue a different opportunity, he briefly mentioned to me that me not speaking up in meetings and taking a back seat kind of gave off the impression that I didn't really care. Studies have shown over and over again that once someone forms an initial impression of you within a few seconds of meeting you, unfortunately, it becomes an uphill battle to change that perception, even if you present a lot of evidence to the contrary. Even after I got more comfortable and I started speaking up more and contributing a little bit more during these meetings, I noticed that I wasn't really being asked a lot of questions and generally not as included in conversations as much as my other coworkers were. It's like when you you first meet someone and you kind of get bad vibes from them, it actually takes a lot of time and a lot of other interactions for you to change your mind about that person. Once someone forms an opinion of you, whether or not it's correct, they tend to look for evidence to confirm their beliefs because people like to be correct. And there's actually a term for this, it's called confirmation bias. As much as I hate this, first impressions matter so much and I really wish I appreciated how much it mattered every time I joined a new team or a new company. If I could go back in time, every time I joined a new team or I started a new job, I would invest a lot more time and energy into starting out really strong and making a big impact quickly, whether it's in meetings or you know contributing to the code base ASAP. In a perfect world, promotions are based entirely on merit it and a good manager will recognize your work without you having to advocate for yourself. At every place I've worked at, each time we shipped a new feature or project, my team's project manager would write this long email and send it company-wide to announce the new features, promote it, and thank the contributors. In addition, they would also bring it up during meetings, memos, in Slack, and at first I wasn't really sure what the point of that was I thought it was just bureaucracy and just stuff that companies did but I then realized that it was actually a way for our project manager to advocate on our team's behalf both at work 
and in real life perception is everything. And what I realized is that this was a way for our project manager to bring visibility into our team. It was a way to make it clear to the executives and everybody in the company that the work our team is doing is critical and therefore more budget and headcount should be allocated to the team. Startups and other companies spend so much time and budget on marketing for good reason. They know that it has a high ROI because if no one knows about their product, no one's going to buy it. And this applies on an individual level as well, right? Your manager probably has a billion other things to think about and you aren't at the top of their priority list. If you're consistently bringing up your accomplishments and advocate for yourself and list out all the things that you've done during your one-on-ones, it's going to make it a lot easier for them to remember that come performance review time. Chances are, if you aren't bringing up your own accomplishments and advocating for yourself, someone else out there is. And you know what they say about a squeaky wheel. Number four, and I think we can all relate to this one, it's getting complacent. You don't want to be the guy that's been at the same company for 10 years, working on the same team, solving the exact same problems. Or maybe you do, I don't know, but you have to recognize the risks that you're putting yourself into. When you've been working at a big company for many years, you start to get this false sense of stability because they have so much money behind them and they move so slow and everything seems to be this well-oiled machine. You stop learning because you just do the same things over and over again for years on end without really much of a challenge. This is why it's so important to keep your skills sharp and never get too complacent. That's why today's sponsor, Brilliant, offers a great way to learn new and relevant skills that will help you in your existing role or just help you learn something to keep your mind fresh. Recently, I was mentoring a new grad and he was having some issues with understanding essential programming concepts. So I explained them to him using brilliant, simple and easy to understand interactive tools, which helped him grasp the concepts really quickly. I've also been using brilliant courses personally to brush up on some calculus recently because I've been thinking of building my first game and I need to catch up on some graphics programming. I really like the fact that I can just spend 15 minutes a day getting a lesson in and I can do it on the phone when I'm commuting. To try everything Brilliant has to offer for free for a full 30 days, visit brilliant.org slash Catherine Lee or scan the QR code on screen. Or you can click on the link in the description box below. You'll also get 20% off an annual premium subscription. In this volatile job market in this day and age, there is no such thing as job security. Just think about it. Microsoft, one of the biggest tech companies in the world, a very profitable tech company recently laid off this employee that's been working there for 33 years. And because he's only been at one big company his entire life, he might have a really hard time adapting to new environments and he doesn't have exposure to different team types, techniques. And when was the last time he even interviewed? So he's probably really out of practice when it comes to interviewing. I mean, he was around when they launched Windows 95. I definitely feel for him because not only is he going to deal with a ton of ageism, but he's only ever worked in one environment, one context, and therefore he doesn't really have a broad range of work experience. I think we've all had that experience of staying at a job for far longer than we probably should. I worked at a startup once where I really loved the people that I worked with, but the job was really just maintaining a very simplistic CRUD app and doing some really basic things with jQuery. Obviously, I was extremely fortunate. It's a very chill job and it paid decently. But the tech stack was really outdated and after a few months, I realized I wasn't learning anything at all. Part of me doesn't really regret staying there for those years because I did really have a good time. What I do regret is getting complacent. I didn't really bother learning anything new. I wasn't keeping my interviewing skills sharp. When I finally decided to leave that startup job because I was getting so bored and I started to interview again, I was so out of my depth and I realized that I was kind of behind my peers who had the same number of years of experience. When I started to interview 
you again, I was like, oh my gosh, I am so unprepared. I have to spend another three to six months just reviewing data structures, algorithms, the latest tech libraries and stuff like that. Besides what I mentioned earlier, which is just having a solid financial safety net to fall back on, keeping your interviewing skills sharp is one of the best things you can do to protect yourself from the volatility of this market. So these days, every time I feel myself getting a little bit too comfortable or I realize I'm not really learning on the job, I make sure to take time out of my day or during the weekends to do a couple of lead code questions, to brush up on my interviewing skills, to learn the new latest technologies, just so that if I do have to start interviewing again, I don't really have to start from zero. By the way, if you're wondering why I have this bright blue controller in my hand, it's because I have some notes that I am using to keep me on track and so I'm flipping through it. I hope you guys found this video useful. Let me know if you relate to any of these regrets and whether or not you've made similar mistakes. Anyways, I will see you in the next one and thanks for watching.